Grace and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you find peace in a chaotic world? How do you find that joy, that peace, that passes all understanding, that contentment, that understanding that God is in control and none, none of this is happening anywhere at any time has caught him by surprise. He is so amazing that he has given us his eternal word here in the scriptures for us to understand, for us to stand on, and for us to, to put our trust and faith through his word to him until he comes for us and brings us into the eternal kingdom. Today we continue our study of the Psalms of Ascents, and this Psalm 131, as we are on our way to 134 from where we started at Psalm 120, Psalm 131 is perfect for these chaotic times, days, and even weeks uh, ahead. We will see that God is immovable. God is indestructible. God sees the end from the beginning, unlike human beings. And God is God. Now this Psalm 131, it's only got three verses. But in these three small verses... The Lord himself packs so much in there that we can stand on and rely on that if we don't grab it and bring it in, into our hearts and embed it in our souls, in our very makeup, well, then we're going to have a little trouble. So I encourage you in these next short moments as we listen to this, as we dig into the scriptures, to grab a hold of God's word and fully depend on it. So I'm going to read Psalm 131. Very quickly, and then we're going to see some amazing things here that, that we are called upon to grab onto because our God is an awesome God, as the song says. Psalm 131, verse 1. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up or proud. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great for me and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. And there is a, uh, there is a significance to this weaning that he's talking about here in verse 2. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. In fact, this is so short I can read it again. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high for me. I do not occupy myself with things too great for me and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. May the Lord bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy, mighty, and precious word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the first thing we see here in verse 1 is that for, for the true believer, now remember I'm talking about Christians and those who, who seek, and those who really sincerely want to know the Lord. So we're talking about born-again believers and those who, who are about to enter the kingdom, truly enter the kingdom of heaven by submitting their lives to Christ and being born again after seeking forgiveness from their sins. I'm not talking about professing Christians or fake Christians or those who think they're uh, those who walk in the world and think they're good enough to get into the kingdom of heaven. This is a narrow uh, teaching. At the same time, it is available for anyone who will seek it. It is, it is dedicated to the true believer, to the elect, and those who, seem, who seek to be part of the elect and knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The first thing we see here, there is no conceit. The first key to understanding and to walking in righteousness with God is, is to have no conceit in your heart. Now, this has to be looked at, at, at in, in two, uh, two levels. First of all, we're going to look at it from the corporate level uh, as a body of Christ. And then we're going to look at it at, on a personal level. On the corporate level, God tells us in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, If my people who are called by my name... Now, does he, now, does you see the two qualifications there? If my people, now, didn't you say, didn't God create everybody on this earth uh, from, the, from Adam all the way to, to the end of time? Of course he did. The, that's, that's the cosmos. 
if my people who are called by my name, there's the qualification right there, who are called by my name. That means you have to acknowledge God as God, Jesus as Lord and Master, and, and walk in, in His ways. Three qualifications there. If my people who are called by my name, because this, why is this important? Because it's important for us to have that basic foundation of, of salvation, of knowing God, covenant God, and then walking with him through the rest of your life in order that you will be able to make it through these chaotic times and understand, understand the scriptures and never falter, never fail, never walk away. Many will walk away from now until the end. And we're seeing it right now with uh, fake Christians. We see it now with fake pastors uh, across America and across the world. We see it a lot. And uh, you and I are not called to that. We are called to walk with him until the end of our days. So there is no conceit if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. 714 from Second Chronicles. Humble themselves. This as the passage says, my heart is not lifted up. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. His people, his church, now we're talking about people who are called by his name as his church. In the old covenant, the old testament, it was Israel. In the church age, it will be the church. When God comes back as prophesied in Zechariah, and the, and the nation of Israel will look upon him whom they have pierced, then um, one third of that nation of Israel will be saved. But the majority of this world is perishing and going away from God into an eternal destruction. Now, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, he will hear from heaven and heal their land. Now, that's a corporate level. On the personal level, I like to look at this. Uh, how do we, um, in our prayers, in, in our way of living, in our walk with God, stay humble and with no conceit? Let's look at 1 Kings, uh, very quickly, chapter uh, 3, 1 Kings ch chapter 3, and we see the prayer of Solomon. Solomon had just dedicated the temple, uh, which he had built, and uh, it says here in verse 3 of chapter 3 in 1 Kings, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, On, only he sacrificed and made offerings in the high places. So Solomon was uh, walking with God at that time uh, when he became king. And, and the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was a, a great high place. Now, the high places were where the pagans were dancing around high poles and all kinds of stuff and, and worshiping the pagan gods and the devil. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, God said, Ask what, I, what shall I give you? God appeared to Solomon in a vision that was written down in the scriptures here. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David. God appeared to Solomon and said, Anything you ask, I'll give to you. Anything. And here's how he prayed when God said to him, uh, Anything you ask, I'll give to you. And, and, and just one second here. If God were to appear to you and say, ask you, what would you like to have? I'll give it to you. Are you going to ask for a BMW, a boat, a house in Destin, Florida? What would you ask for? Think about that for a second. So, so Solomon, in his uh, response to God in his prayer, said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness. David was 100% God. In fact, God himself said, David is a man after my own heart in righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on the throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, here's, now here's what Solomon is praying for. O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in this place of David, my father, though I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And no matter how old we get in life, and how we, we know how to go out in our cars and go out to the street and go to work or go on vacation or something and come back in. Basically, in life, when it comes right down to it, most of us uh, don't know how to do it properly unless we're fully relying on God. 
Now you say, look at the rich guy down the world, look at the corrupt politician, look at the corrupt uh, X, Y, Z, uh, who, don't, who don't know God. Look how they're living. They're living well. Yeah, but that's a temporal, materialistic thing. That's only for a short time for which they will pay later on uh, before God. The average Christian, without God, without God guiding him, does not know how to go ahead and to go through life. And you may think you do, but the more you get into the scriptures and the more you walk through life and you face all lives, uh, incoming flak and, uh, and shrapnel and all that stuff, you're going to realize sometimes, most of the time, in fact, you don't know how to do this without God. So that's what Solomon is saying here. I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen. And then he goes to verse 9. Give your servant therefore, knowing that most of us in this life really don't know how to live life without God and without fully depending on him. He said, Solomon said, give your servant therefore an understanding. An understanding mind to govern your people. That understanding mind that he's praying for is called being. B-I-Y-N, being in the Hebrew. It means a, a spirit of discernment. And that's what we need right now more than anything else. It's wisdom, discernment. Uh, how do we walk this out? How do we discern between what's good and bad in this world? How do we discern uh, how to, in, in, in matters of, of things where things seem right, but basically it could be wrong and leading us in the wrong direction? That's what we should be praying for. If God says to you, what should I give you? And you don't ask for a brand new car or a brand new boat or whatever. You ask for wisdom and discernment and you will never regret it. I'll give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind that I may discern between good and evil. See? So, for who is able to govern you this great people? And, and here's what happened in verse 10. It pleased the Lord that Solomon asked him this, and God said to him, because you've asked for this wisdom, uh, understanding, um, a discerning mind, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies. So he didn't ask for riches, which came later on anyway. He didn't ask for the life of his enemies because he was a man of peace. But have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. To discern what is right. Behold. I now do according to your word. Behold, I, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked. So even though Solomon didn't ask for riches and all that sort of thing, God said this, because you didn't ask for that, I will also give you both riches and honor, so that no other king will compare to you in all your days. And the qualification, of course, is if you walk in my ways, keep my statutes and my commandments, I will lengthen your days. So, the first part of verse 1, we see there is no conceit in, Sol in, in, in the believer. In no conceit in the believer. In, in the corporate sense, as part of the body of Christ, and on a personal sense, in our daily living. The second thing we see is keep a humble heart always. And the third thing is keep your eyes focused. Keep your eyes focused. This is how we get through, as we said in the beginning, how, do, how we get through chaotic times. You know the old song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look on his wonderful face. Well, how do we turn our eyes upon Jesus? First of all, we seek him daily. We seek him daily. Psalm 37, 40 says, the Lord helps and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them. And why does, he, why does the Lord do that? Why? Because they have taken refuge in him. In fact, it, it, it was, it's the present, uh, present tense of the verb here. They take refuge in him. So let me read that again. Psalm 37, verse 40. You seek him daily. The Lord helps and delivers them. Notice it's all present tense. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. So we turn our eyes upon Jesus and then seek refuge in him. And then we turn our heart to him because we have taken refuge in him. Now, we have taken refuge in the Lord, and, and we are under his wings, as we, as we see in Psalm 91, verse 1. We are under his wings. We, he is our fortress. He is our, he's our citadel. He, he's our bay, uh, bay, Fort Benning or Fort Hood. And uh, he's our, We can go hide in him. He's stronger than Fort Hood, in fact. 
all think about all the big great bases in the United States, Fort Bragg, Fort Fort Benning, Fort Drum, all that stuff. God is bigger than all them command uh, combined. Now, turn, so we turn our eyes. For, uh, we, we keep our eyes focused on Him. We, we find we take refuge in Him. Then we turn our hearts to Him, fully and completely, and and uh, committed to Him, and take refuge in Him. You know why? Because the eyes of the Lord runneth to and fro across the whole earth in defense of those of those who are loyal to Him. You have. To be loyal to God. It's Jesus plus nothing. It's not Jesus plus coexisting with every other religion in this world. It's Jesus plus nothing. If you know that above all else, then you will make it till the end. It's Jesus plus nothing. Nothing in this world compares to Jesus. There's a certain worldwide religious leader who went to a, a certain temple in, in Turkey and kissed their, uh, and bowed down in there and kissed their holy book, quote unquote. He's going to answer to God for that. You cannot do that sort of thing. What what does what does uh, Christ have with Belial? Nothing. It's Jesus plus nothing. So be intentional when you're turning your heart to God. Be observant and teachable. When he teaches you a lesson uh, through a trial or tribulation, listen to him. And above all, be grateful. So this is how we are developing ourselves now daily to build up ourselves, to turn from our uh, pride from, and wickedness, to turn from the world while we're living in the world. Now, we're called to live in the world. Remember John uh, chapter 17. God didn't say to take us, uh, Jesus didn't pray to God in, in, in John's uh, uh, high priestly prayer for God to take us out of this world, which will happen one of these days anyway. He prayed for us to be in this world, but also not to let the world corrupt us. And so we turn our eyes we keep our eyes focused on Him. We turn our heart fully on Him. We are intentional by doing it daily. We are observant for His teachings, for His uh, for His little lessons in life. Daily, and there's one almost every day, in fact. And, they, and we have to remain teachable now. When, he, when we observe these things and we see the little lessons there, we see the little life lessons, and we are teachable and we receive it because that way the devil can't deceive us. And then we remain grateful that he's even considering us to, to, to do us this way. Amen and amen. So, let's go to verse 1b now. It says, uh, verse 1b of Psalm 131 says, I do not occupy myself with things too great or too marvelous for me. You know, so some um, believers or some professing Christians, let's put it broadly, think they have to get themselves involved in everything. I'm not talking about ministry. I'm talking about everything out there, um, politics, uh, econ whatever's going on. They have to be involved. They have to be, take everything upon unto themselves. We don't have to do that. Here's how you remain victorious uh, against this evil world right now. As we see all the corruption, lying and cheating, and and deception. As we see all that, we fo fully rely on God, and uh, we go to Psalm 46. The entire of Psalm 46 is written to us for this time. God is our refuge and strength, our, our present help, our present help. Scripture is written from now until the end of time, our present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains remove to the heart of the sea. And then verse 4. Remember, take the whole chapter, take the whole chapter of Psalm 46, 1 to 11, and, and just, uh, just dig into it. Verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in her midst. She shall not be moved. God will help her with morning dawns. The nations rage, the evil world around us. We see it. The one world government is coming, the new world order. But God is still God. He's on the throne. The, nation, the nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. That's the nations. Let them go. It's, it's their appointed time with, their devil, with, the, with the Antichrist and the devil. That's their time. Verse 7 tells us the Lord of hosts is with us. Now, when you see the Lord of hosts is with us, that means the Lord of heaven's armies. He's not a, he's not a weak God. He's, not a, he's a meek God, but he's not, he's not weak. He's a powerful God, but he shows mercy and love. To his people and 
And the scripture tells us that the, the rain falls equally on the, on the just and the unjust. So both the unsaved and the saved will receive blessings. But the Lord of the heaven's armies are with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. And what's going to happen to this earth when the church is raptured out of here, it's going to be beyond comprehension. But still, some are going to be saved. Verse 9 of Psalm 46, he makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. Talk about armaments. He burns the chariots with fire. Verse 10, this is for the believer now. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Fear God and trust his commandments. You know, um, take, this, take this, this passage to heart. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. Last two verses, last two verses of that entire beautiful book of Ecclesiastes which is something we should live with in and live uh, um, grounded in because it is uh, our, our, our manual for the meaning of life. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14 says, The end of the matter is this. All has been heard. No matter all the teachings, everything that we've heard uh, in church and in life, and, and we've read in books and, and everything else, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. Fear God, trust, and trust and all that is part of fearing God. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Fear God and keep his commandments. Trust him. Trust only him. How do you survive in a chaotic world? In this verse 1 alone, we have all this richness First of all, no conceit. Keep a humble heart. Keep your eyes focused. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your heart upon Jesus. Be loyal to Him. Be intentional daily. Be observant and teachable. Be grateful. Do not occupy yourself with things that are beyond us. We, do, we are not called to change the world. We are called to change ourselves and those around us. Because when you stand before Him, and as Ecclesiastes says, God will bring every deed into judgment. Those who are doing wrong things and wicked things and then trying to take over the world, they will answer and it will not go well for them. Fear God, trust God, and keep His commandments. And look what it says at the beginning of this verse here, before we go to verse 2. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. O oh Lord. Lord here is the name Yahweh. Yahweh is the God of of the covenant. He is the covenant God. He's the God of the relationship. He is the God who wants to have fellowship with us. Adonai will take care of the business later on, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies. But Yahweh is for us. Do you, friend, do you have a relationship with Yahweh? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Is he your master? All of this is not possible, persevering in a chaotic world, in a chaotic world, if you don't, if you do not have a relationship with Yahweh. Verse 2, in verse 2, we are called to depend on the sufficiency of God. We, in verse 2, it says, I, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weak child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. This is actually is calling for this, to us to, be, to depend on the sufficiency of God. Why do we def depend on the sufficiency of God? First of all, His kingdom is not of this world. And that's from John 18, 36. You can only depend on something and, 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 uh, and look up to someone who's greater than you. And, and there's no one greater than God. There's no, high, there's no higher power than Almighty God. There's no, there's no greater power than Jesus Christ and Yahweh and Adonai. The Holy Spirit lives with us and confirms that. You, you don't have to take, be guessing and, and doubting. <laughs> You just have to believe that. And you know it because the Holy Spirit confirms it. His kingdom is not of this world. We can, uh, only someone with a, only a higher power can deliver us from this mess. And he has. And he will. And he promises us. Promised us and, he, and he sees. He sends his Holy Spirit to seal us until that day. 
I tell you, the Christian life is, is authentic, it's real, and it's a beautiful thing. His kingdom is not of this world. His ways are not our ways. Because that's how we can depend on the sufficiency of God. That, that verse 2 calls for in Psalm 131. His ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8. His call is, not, is for us to live a simple and a sincere and a genuine, authentic life. Here's what uh, the, the, the passage says in, uh, one, in Corinthians. For our boast is this, that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity but by the grace of God, supremely towards you. In other words, God is calling us to the simple and sincere life. So his kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. His ways are not our ways, and he's calling us to have a simple and, and authentic life in, in the godly realm. And then in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 2, his work is done in broad daylight. God is a transparent God. Everything God has done is not done in secret. He doesn't have a secret club with secret handshakes. He doesn't not work in the night like the devil does. He does not work behind closed doors like the devil does. He works out in the open because everything belongs to him and he created everything. His work is done in broad daylight and, in, and it's done only in the, in the faithful hearts and the lives and the actions of the first faithful and, and fully dedicated and loyal man or woman of Christ. Listen to what 2 Corinthians verse 4 2 says. But as we renounce this graceful, as we renounce this graceful, underhanding ways, so we're not supposed to be part of that. And we have fully you know, within our rights as Christians to denounce evil. We fill, we refuse, sorry, we refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word. We don't do like some Christians and start twisting God's, God's word. Or in, uh, there's some pastor in, in Atlanta, son of a famous preacher, says, at Andy Stanley, you're not going to teach from the Old Testament anymore because it's too judgmental. We don't mess with God's word. He's tampering with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, the open statement of the truth, cover to cover, 66 books, the Bible. We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. We will commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And there is more. There's so much more, but this is a short message. There's clean living, there's self-control, there's self-discipline, and there's been moving forward in faith. We can only be sufficient by knowing God's attributes, His personality, and His Word. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4-6 to six, as, uh, as we look at the final part here of wrapping up the, the sufficiency of, li of living with God in God's realm and God, with God's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4-6. to six. Such is the confidence. Now, confidence, as we said before, is from the Latin word con, two, two Latin words. Con means with, fide, faith. Confidence means living with faith. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is, as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient, he said it twice, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of the new covenant. Every Christian, every man, every woman, or child who is a born-again believer is a minister, is called to minister the word of God in so many ways. The pastor is a minister too, but that's a different calling. He's a shepherd. We are ministers of the gospel. But our sufficiency from God who has made us sufficient, twice he said that, to be ministers of a new covenant, the new covenant from Yahweh, and that covenant is Jesus Christ. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit it lives in those who believe. For the letter kills, the, letter, the commandment, the law, but the Spirit gives life. The Holy Spirit is our life. So sufficiency in the Lord is depending on Him and can only be found in knowing Him, His promises, and then being fully committed to Him. It is a requirement of being a disciple. The Luke, um, it, it all comes down to this. Are you a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you cannot be fully sufficient, uh, on, uh, fully reliant on God, F-R-O-G, fully reliant on God, frog, think about it that way, you cannot be a, uh, a frog in the kingdom if you're not born again. So here's, and Jesus himself uh, confirms this in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 
fully rely on the covenant God, Yahweh. Verse 1, O Lord, Yah o Yahweh, covenant God of relationship. And then we look at the second part of verse 2 here. It says, like a, like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. We all know what a weaned child is. Uh, a weaned child depends on his mom for, for life, for and back in Bible days, and um, more increasingly now, we see a lot of mo mothers breastfeeding their babies. And uh, the, the child depends fully on his mother, his or her mother, that first year or so for nourishment, for food. And and you can tell when the child is hungry, you know, fussing, uh, sc screaming, crying out loud, and, and then comforted by that, by being weaned. But after a while, uh, by, by, by being breastfed, after a while, the child is weaned off. So the child is fully, um, is looking at, at, the, at the mom, at the mother, as a provision. Now, when the child is weaned off the mother, the child then de develops a, because of that connection, physical connection of being, uh, um, being fed and now being weaned off, the child has a connection with the mother and is now, has that warmth and that comfort that the child is, the love that that baby has for her mother, for his mother, is just growing and growing in, in beauty and wonder and wonder and, and just you can see it with a toddler and a mom. You just look at them interacting. It's a beautiful thing. And so, when we are weaned, as, as it says here, we are like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. So. We attach ourselves to God, but, but then our, um, He's our provision. But because He is our provider, and because we are growing in, we, we, we deny ourselves, and we take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, we are just starting to grow in love now. We're growing in more and more in love with Him, with our Father, our Creator. Because we have done everything that we talked about in the first two verses. We've turned our eyes upon Jesus. We're fully dependent on Him. Our sufficiency is, is only from Him. Because we understand all that now, and we start, uh, in our self-control and our self-discipline, start denying ourselves daily and following Him. Our, we, are, we are weaned ourselves now from baby's milk, and now we're, we're in love with God because we're now uh, in, full in the meat of this, of this matter. We are understanding Him now. We have, we have a being, we have a discerning mind that Solomon prayed for, as we talked about in verse 1. We, we, he's given us that wisdom and understanding. And it, it's an amazing thing to be a Christian and to understand these things. That he says, I, like a weaned child is my soul within me. It, it's it, because we have that covenant love relationship with God. We are going with him and in him and through him. And now we wean ourselves from milk and we're now into the meat. And then verse 3 says, Verse 3 says, uh, O Israel, hope in the Lord for this time forth and forevermore. Of course, our hope is uh, built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. Hope, is, there's so many verses on hope that you can study. But our faith leads us, first of all, to being praying up, staying up, and looking up. And I'd like to close this uh, this here, uh, thinking about verse 3, O Israel, hope in the Lord. But, but with a passage from Romans chapter 15, as we wrap this up, this beautiful study of Psalm 131. And, and this is, a, as uh, we have talked about in the past, we are studying the Psalms of the Saints. The rhythm is uh, goes in threes, uh, trials, trust, and triumph. This is triumphant. We are, we are in the triumphant phase here before we get into the last three Psalms of a Saints. So this is a last uh, in Psalm 130. We were in trust. Uh, now we're in triumph, and then the, and when we go to Psalm 132, we'll be back in the trial. Let's read here, as we wrap up this study, Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing given all we talked about in this past half hour, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now, 
we talk, remember, we're, stu we're studying how to live through these chaotic times. This entire psalm, three verses, has all of that in it. Three verses, as we have seen in the past half hour. And we come to the last verse where he's talking about Israel. I mean, and now we're in the church age. We're talking about the church age until the end of time. But in the meantime, he's given us this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You may abound in hope. And our hope is that as we, as we see the times and times getting worse, as we see the day drawing closer, where the Lord Jesus Christ will, will descend in a shout and draw the church unto himself, and then uh, the book of Revelation unfolds. As we see that unfolding day by day, and there's no doubt about it now, our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. And it only uh, pertains to those who know him as Lord and Savior. Search your hearts, search your minds to see if you are in the faith. We love you and praise you, Lord Jesus, and thank you that you've given us this promise, this hope that can only be found in you. In your name I pray, amen.